books. Open your hymn books, please. We do something a little bit different today. Open your hymn books to hymn number 178. 178. <clears throat> Jesus loves even me. Let's sing it all together now. 178. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms I flee. When I remember that Jesus loves me, I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this, this uh, day, this hour that we have. Lord, I pray, God, that you'd use this time. Uh, to just allow us to bask, Lord, and to soak in some truths about the fact that you love even me. Um, we thank you for it, God, and uh, we just pray, Lord, that you be with this time, with this message, strengthen and encourage our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Jesus loves even me. I'm preaching out of the hymnal today. Preaching out of the hymnal. <laughs> <clears throat> the Bible records in John 3.16 that wonderful truth that, in fact, God loved the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's a great truth that rings throughout the scriptures. And as I was thinking about what to preach this morning, this song just kind of came into my head and into my heart. And I thought to myself, you know, it's amazing that Jesus loves even me. Yeah, we know he loves the whole world. We know that great truth is there, that he has extended his love into the whole world. But Jesus loves even me. And here in the hymn, we have three different topics that follow from verse 1, verse 2, and verse 3. It says, we have a written love. We have a whenever, wherever love. And we have a wonderful love. The written love is explained when it says that love in the book he has given. The love in the book he has given. And John 3, 16 is just one simple, very plain, very clear sight. And it's the most popular verse in the entire world so that they would even hold it up at football stadiums. John 3.16. And it proclaims to the entire world that God loves you. God so loved you, world. Even as rotten, even as filthy, even as worldly sinners, God loved the world so much that he gave. Go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 in this vein. Look, we're looking at the written love. The written love. I'm so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Romans chapter 5, very famous verse, in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we see that worldly love, in other words, worldly from a carnal person, is scarce that it would be exhibited through death for a righteous man. 
Worldly love is, is a maybe. It's a peradventure that death would be offered for a good man. Right? The Bible says very clearly there, for scarcely for a righteous man. It's very scarce that for a righteous man I would die. Maybe I would die for a good man. I would dare to, perhaps. I would dare to maybe die for that, that good man. But God, I love those, but God's, God commendeth, God proves, God shows forth his love toward us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible records there in verse 6, in due time, when we are without strength, when there was nothing left, when there was nothing in us, when there was nothing to give, nothing that we had, at that exact moment, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely we would exhibit that love. Maybe we would for a really, really good man. And yet God, and yet Christ, shows that by giving of himself. As it says in John 3.16, and even as it says here, Christ died for us. It is written, if you look in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, another famous verse, Ephesians chapter 2, showing of the great love that God has for us. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past, so in the past tense, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all, we all, we all, every one of us, had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. By nature we were the children of wrath. This was past tense to those that are saved, and that's who the Ephesians is written to, that's who the book of Ephesians is written to. In time past we walked according to the course of this world. In time past we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. In the past tense we followed after that spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, that spirit that now oversees, instructs, leads about the entirety of the world. That was us. That was our desires. That was our fleshly conversation. That was the lust that we were under and following after. And the Bible says that we were by nature the children of wrath. So our natural state was wrath. Our natural state was God looking upon us and seeing wrath. That's all he could face us with. That's all he could respond to us with. And yet the Bible records that he so loved us even when we were in that state. Isn't that wonderful? God so loved us even in that state. That's why you have again in verse 4 another one of those wonderful, but God, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. So the Bible here records again another one of those great contrasting verses. But God, even though we followed our lusts, even though we followed a wicked spirit, even though we followed after disobedience and wrath was all we deserved upon us, God is rich in mercy. That's a great contrasting to all that we are, all that we were in time past when we were dead in our trespasses. God contrasts that with, yes, his mercy, but also his great love wherewith he loved us. God so loved us. Us. Even as this hymn reads, I'm so glad our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. This is just a few of the examples of where God shows forth his love. A few pages back in Galatians chapter 2, the Bible highlights what this love's purpose is. In Galatians chapter 2, in verse 20, we saw also previous that Christ died for us when we were ungodly. But look what happened also with us in that same transaction, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I love this verse. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He loved you. He loved me. He loved the world. And here in direct contact, text he's saying he loved you Christian he loved you believer and he gave himself for you and when that happened when that exchange happened when you believed on Christ when you were born again this is exactly the mechanics of it you were crucified with Christ in other words you died 
your, your old man was dead. Your old man was crucified with Christ. And then look at this. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So who's living here? Yes, I live, but it's not I. It's Christ that lives in me. That could be a little bit confusing if we weren't to understand the contrast of the old man and the new man. You were raised anew. You were raised fresh. That spiritual man quickened within you came alive, though it was dead in trespasses and sins, and now lives with Christ within it. Christ in me, the hope of glory, the Bible recur records. So this is why he came. This is why we have the celebration that we have this time of year. And I know there's lots of debate about the timing of Christ's exact birth, but regardless, we set aside this time, and it's, it's a time when we can all at least agree to, to give homage, to give praise to the Jesus Christ to the Christ child that came to this earth to die for us. And he did it by starting as, as a babe in a manger. He came in order that he might die for us. He came because he loved us. He came to give himself for us. We know that Jesus went from Bethlehem's manger to Calvary's tree, and he did that to prove his great love for us. I'm so glad that Jesus loves even me. Though he extends his love to the world, though he extends his love to the sinner and to the, to the rotten person and the person that, yeah, thinks they're pretty good, to every person that has ever breathed a breath on this earth, he extends his love and says, I so loved you that I gave my son. I so loved you that I came to die for you. I so loved you that I could be in your place that you could receive of that love and receive of the gift that was myself. So God says to each and every person, he did what he did to prove his great love for us. These aren't just fables. These aren't just nursery rhymes. These aren't just uh, stories that we read about. These aren't just, um, just a, a fanciful thing. These are real life events recorded in a real life spiritually inspired book of God. Yes, originally it was recorded under the hand of great scribes who were meticulous about it, but I believe even God had his hands on there because of the typos that could come just because humans are humans. But the reality is, is that what we behold, what we handle, what we have now is the written word of God. And this is a history of the exact events. And I am so glad that within the history of the exact events that God has given to us of the past, of the present, and of the future, I am so glad that within the pages we have written that Jesus loves even me. Jesus loves even me. There's that famous uh, hymn that little kids sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And isn't that the truth? It's, it's the strength of God that reaches out to a child, shows them the word, and says, I love you. And that's how a child would even know that. That's how I would know it. That's how, when I was born again, and was just a little baby. That's how I came to that knowledge. was because the Bible told me so. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word, word of God. And I am so glad that our Father tells of his love in this wonderful, gracious, just wonderful, amazing book that he gave unto us. I'm so glad that he gave us the word of God. And the wonderful things that are recorded in it, I see in the dearest of them all, according to the hymn writer, and according to my belief, the dearest truth is that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Jesus loves even me. There is this uh, wherever love, if you look. The Bible says, and why is this repeated quite often? It says, his mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. Just time and time, especially in the Psalms. You hear his mercy endureth forever. Why would that repeat itself so many times? His mercy endureth forever. Could it be that his mercy endureth forever? Could that be why God is trying to say that over and over and over? I think it's lest we forget. Whenever God repeats something, whenever God emphasizes something, whenever God shows it to you time and time and time and time again, it's to the purpose that you would remember that, hey, man, his mercy endureth forever. Right. God loves us. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. The Bible says... That same truth that wherever you stray as a believer, God still loves you. You cannot flee from that love. Why? Because his mercy endureth forever. To the saved, God is constantly, consistently, thoroughly extending mercy. Extending mercy. Extending mercy. And then that, that mercy endureth always. That mercy endureth forever. So when you're scared, when you're worried, when you're troubled, 
when you're at the end of your rope, when you just don't know what to do next, when you're ashamed, when you're in sin, when you're feeling like you're lost, when you're, when you're feeling, you're, you're in doubt, you're just confused. You're, again, at the end of your rope, you're at your wit's end. You don't know what to do. You need to remind yourself that his mercy endureth forever. Too often Christians get caught in the trap where they think that God's mercy has a, has, a, has a limit, has an end. And we all have a different scale of what we think is like the worst thing we can do. And, and, and quite often in my life, and I think you, if you're honest, you'd admit, you've pushed yourself, you've done things, you've been, you've been wicked to a point where you're like, man, I must have crossed the line with God. Suddenly you're, you're, you're reading the Bible and you're not getting as much from it. You're trying to sing hymns and... And you just can't have any heart behind it. You're trying to pray and you're at a loss of words and you're like, God is just not talking to me. I must have pushed myself past the limit where, where he's just not merciful. He's done with me. He's not going to use me anymore. He's not going to speak to me anymore. I've blown it as a Christian. But the Bible is clear. His mercy endureth forever. God is for you. Look in Romans chapter 8. God is for you. He is substitutionary for you, just like we explained to that young Young man today, uh, yesterday, he is substitution for you, covering your sins. But he is also for you in the here and now. He is for you. He is with you. He is on board with you. Though you forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray, wherever you stray. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 says, Romans 8 verse 31, And what? What shall we say? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up. And here it says, for us all. So that's pointing back to the question from verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? So he spared his son. He gave his son for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Look at this. Who shall lay anything to the charge, to the accusation, to the, to the guilty uh, call, to, to, their, to their role? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. We tell this to people when we get to the door. When we get to the door and we're leading people through a gospel presentation, we tell them that God is for them. We tell them that his mercy endureth forever. We tell them that there is nothing that can separate them from the love of God if they were to just receive of his love by faith and become one of God's elect. And yet too often we as Christians forget that truth for ourselves. We beat ourselves up. We put ourselves down. We have those crazy thoughts like, am I even saved? You just have these weird ideas that come to your mind when you're just at the lowest of low. You're just wondering to yourself, why would God love even me? But just as this hymn says, Jesus loves even you. Yes, even when you're at your lowest. Even when you've done wickedly against him. Even when you've done despite unto him. You've, you've, you've sinned and you think that, like, surely I've done this time and time and time and time again. And I'm weighed down, but certainly God is grieved to the point where he's just not going to use me. The reality is, is that God is for you. And look at this. Verse 34. It is Christ that died, remember, not you, except your old man. Yea, rather, that is risen again, and you're raised again new in Christ, as it says in Galatians 2, verse 20, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So if you have the Christ, if you have the Son of God, if you have the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Anointed One, ever living with mercy that endureth forever, standing at the right hand of God, pleading for your iniquities, asking the Lord to forgive your sins, ever living, able, in a moment, as soon as you transgress, as soon as you trespass, saying, Father, forgive him. Father, forgive him. Father, forgive him. Who's going to lay anything to your charge? Who is going to condemn you? We are more than conquerors through him. 
And it's not because of what's in you. It's because of, like we already said, what the Bible says. I am so glad that my Father in heaven tells the love in the book he has given. Look down in verse 35. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who will? If Christ is there, if Christ loves you, if God so loved you, if he said that that love has a mercy that endureth forever associated with it, this question is almost rhetorical, but I love reading it anyways. Shall tribulation or distress, shall persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword, shall any of these things separate us from the love of God? As it is written, verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed. All the day long we are counted as sheep toward the slaughter. And here's the answer to that question. Who shall separate us? Shall tribulation, distress, shall all these things, shall anything separate us? It's a great, big, affirmative, nay! In all these things we are more than conquerors. Man, what is more than a conqueror? What is more than something that is overcome? A conqueror is on top. And we're more than that. We are more than conquerors through what? Through him that loved us. Through Christ. Because he loved us, we are more than conquerors. And here it is. This is what we all need as Christians. I am persuaded. We need to be persuaded. We need to be settled. We need to be established. We need to be rooted and grounded in this truth. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing that can separate the love of God between us. There's nothing that can push us far enough from the love of God that it cannot reach us. We are established. We are steadfast. We are sure. We are locked into that love. We need to be persuaded of that. Because even though that is truth, it is not truth to us unless we apply it. There are so many truths contained in the Bible, including the truth of salvation, which we preach and teach unto others, which we try to get people to receive of that truth. And we say, hey, you believe all of these things, right? You believe that Christ died for you. You believe all of these truths from the Bible that I've just shared with you. Why don't you accept the free gift? Why don't you apply this truth to yourself? And if the person says, no, nah, I'm not going to accept that, they don't receive it. And in the same way, Christian, if you read these truths and go, yeah, I, I believe that death, life, angels, principalities, things present, things to come, nor height, nor depth, none of this stuff shall separate me from the love of God. I believe that. But you don't take that and, and actually persuade yourself, actually apply it, actually receive of that truth and say, you know what? That's the truth and I'm sticking to it. That's the truth. I'm believing it without a shadow of a doubt. That's the truth. And even though I'm scared, worried, at the end of my rope, troubled, confused, even though everything's falling apart around me, I'm going to look at that and say, I can't get away from the love of God. Even if I have sinned against, I'm not getting away from the love of God because God so loved the world, God so loved me, and I'm persuaded of it. There's nothing that's going to separate me from the love of God. I'm in His love because I'm in Christ. Until you receive that, until you believe that, until you apply that truth, it's no good for you. It's not because of you that you're a conqueror. You are sustained you are made sure, and it's as eternal and sure and positive and grounded and established. Write it down. Never erase it. That it just the same as God is eternal. It, you're sure in his love. As much as his mercy endureth forever, his love endureth forever, and that applies to you. But you need to believe that. You need to receive that unto yourself. I think sometimes this is a major hurdle when it comes to the Christian life and, and, and comes to making those next steps for God. God may have called you for something. God may have chosen you for a certain task, a certain duty, and we say, ah, God can never use me. There's no way God would love me that much. There's no way God would work in me that much. I've done this, I've done that. Backslidden Christians have this same pitfall where they just say, you know what, I've gone so far from God. God can never use me. I don't read my Bible anymore. I never go to church. I just... I might as well put a fork in it and just live out my last days and then go to heaven when I die. There's nothing that I can do to get back into the fight. And this is a major hurdle for backslidden Christians. But you need to take these types of truths that though you forget him and wander away, still he loves you wherever you stray. And I love this. It continues. It says, back to his dear loving arms would I flee 
When I remember that Jesus loves me, you need to remember that truth. You need to bring that truth into your remembrance. And as soon as you embrace the fact that God loves you, God loves you with an everlasting love, God loves you with an eternal love, you can live in that love, you can embrace that love, and you can walk in that love, and you can just simply go to him as you would any loving father and say, Father, forgive me. And he's right there waiting, welcoming you back into the family, into the love, into the favor that he had. He always had it for you. You had simply removed yourself from it. There's no need to remove yourself from it. It's there. It's present. It's always there. Just like the, first, the second verse of Jesus loves me says, is, Jesus loves me. He who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let this little child come in. It's because Jesus Christ died that you have the love of God, which you have nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our love, our Lord. I'm so happy that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Oh, if there's only one song I could sing, when in his beauty I see the great king, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. And that is a, truly a wonder. Oh, what a wonder that in eternity, it'll be the same song. In eternity, we'll have the same greatest focus. Amazing that God would love me. I believe that's still going to startle us there. I, I, I still believe we're going to wonder when we see the great treasures, when we see the great inheritance, when we see the great wonder of the kingdom of God, and we see Jesus Christ face to face, and we see him in all his glory, and we behold him in his infinite greatness, and then we kind of stand there in awe of him and wonder to ourselves Jesus loves even me he's going to be he's going to be enthroned in the highest he's going to be lifted up by the entire world everyone finally confessing that Jesus Christ is lord to the glory of God the father and you're going to go who am i who am i but it's because of his wonderful love that we will stand in that sight it's because of his wonderful love that we will be in that kingdom and we'll have that one song that we can sing. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. As we saw in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, as we saw in Romans chapter 5, and verse 6, when we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is the great un untouchable truth. That is the great thing that's going to mystify and confuse our minds is that God would prove his love towards sinners. We have a hard enough time loving people that are wrong to us, loving people that hurt us, loving people that, uh, that hate us, um, and yet God does that with ease. God does that in all his glory. It's so wonderful that we can have that love exhibited to us. And I believe that there is a purpose for that. If you look in 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, in 1 John chapter 3, the Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And that's the great truth that we will one day behold Christ and then we will be as he is. The Bible says, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. God exhibited this wonderful love to us in order that we would be conformed to the image of his son. That love working in us, that love motivating us to do right and to do good and to live righteously and to do righteously is, is simply God working his love through us. It's like this. If I didn't love my son, I wouldn't be teaching my son right. I wouldn't be teaching him to do good things. I wouldn't be motivating him to behave because there is no love in simply just letting the child be to their own devices. Why? Because they're going to get hurt. 
hurt, when you get harmed, they're going to grow up as wicked, rotten people. Sin will destroy them. But because I love them, because he is called the son of Josh, I exhibit my love toward the child by correcting him, by chastening him, by bringing him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord so that he won't have to make, and this is where the illustration falls short, that he won't have to make the same mistakes that his dad made. Christ was perfect, exhibits perfect love through fallen people. I'm imperfect. I exhibit fallen love through my son. But that's where it ends. I can only exhibit so much fallen love to a child to bring them up to a state of, of being a, a fallen lover themselves, being somebody that... And so that is why I need the love of Christ. I need that wonderful love to come in and through me so that now when I'm exhibiting to my son a status of love, a state of love, it's beyond what I could do in my own flesh. It's beyond what I could do in my corrupt body. I'm able to exhibit the love of God through myself by being faithful to God, by serving God, by allowing God to use me in that capacity so that my son now feels and experiences a greater love than he could ever experience just from his dad in the flesh. And that's why the relationship of being a son of God is so important. As the son of God, I am now joint heir with Christ. I am now partaker of the hope that we see here. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I am only pure by the blood of Christ, but I'm still able to purify myself to be up to at least a higher level than I was yesterday. And at least a higher level than I was yesterday. At least a higher level than I was yesterday as I constantly try to grow in that love. That love of Christ, that wonderful love that I can sing and glorify and shout praises unto was exhibited, was shown unto me that I might show it through me. The purpose of God loving me as a son is in order that I would love others. Jesus said it multiple times. He said, he said, he said, um, love them wherewith the love that thou lovest me. He was talking about the relationship of the father and the son and how it was exhibited unto others. And we have that same ability. We have Christ in us, do we not, as Christians? Yes, amen, we have Christ in us. So therefore, as the father loves the son, as the father loves his children, we're able to then exhibit that same love unto others. And that's the purpose of the love of God extending unto the believers. Yes, there is that wide open love that reaches out to the whole world and causes the whole world to repentance, to the acknowledging of the truth, that they would be saved. But there is a special love for the children. There's a special love of the father. It says here, what manner of love he hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children children of God. That is special. That is something beyond any love that any human can exhibit. That's it right. is a special love. And the purpose of that love is that it would go to others. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 11. For this is the message that she have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That's the purpose. That's the, that's the overarching message, especially in 1 John. It's just that the love of God would go forth unto the brethren, unto others who call themselves sons of God, or who are called sons of God. Verse 13, it's so important. Why? Because marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And in verse 18, My little children, let us love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And this is how the love of God is exhibited. Marvel not the world is going to hate you. Marvel not that there's a difference between the love of the world and the love amongst brethren. And you're going to recognize that if you've been a Christian for any length of time, that as the love of God grows in you, as you are connected with the love of God, and in that stream of the Holy Spirit pouring out like a fountain of living water unto others, you'll find out right away that when there's a brother in the room, you almost instantly are one with another. You're almost instantly in fellowship and in love one another. And it's just one of those other inner tells where you can say, you know, I know I'm a believer just because I just love believers. Well, well that's, not, that's not like an outward show that someone could look at somebody and say, yeah, that man's saved. Well, that's just an inner testimony. And what is that testimony of? It's that God is putting the love of the brethren within you and it's connecting it to another brethren who has that same love. It's a unity of the Spirit is exactly what it is. And that is the purpose of the love of God is to create that unity of the Spirit. I desire that this church, this congregation would have 
that same unity of the Spirit as we work together, as we love one another, as we grow together. And we ought to do it, as the Bible says here in verse 18, not just in word, not just saying, I love you, bro, Godspeed, you know, but doing it in deed and in truth, doing it with acts, doing it with outward shows, doing it by supporting, by lifting up, by caring one for another, and in truth, and in sincerity. And in a love that passeth all knowledge, a special kind of love that only comes from God the Father. It's charity. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's a love that passeth all understanding. It's a love that is acted out. And that's exactly what charity is, as it's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The Bible says, and this is what we ought to exhibit, and we ought to extend, and we ought to show, and we ought to do in deed and in truth. Just what it says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all all things. Charity never faileth. And this is why we know that this charity here is something that is only exhibited through that love of the Father, through that that goodness that the Father extends. Why? Because charity never faileth. So much in this word fails. And we see as even as we read down, it says we know in part, we prophesy in part. It says this is going to fail, that's going to fail. But then it says the greatest of all these is charity and charity will never fail. That is the mercy that passed, that extended and endureth forever. That is the love that extends and endureth forever. That is the same love that was written in the book he has given. That is the same love that reaches out to you even when you stray from him, even when you're pushing back against love. This is the same love that we're going to sing of and rejoice over and embrace and welcome and just be so pleased and overjoyed with when we stand in heaven. It's that wonderful love. It's profound and yet it's simple. Look with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And in verse 14, the Bible says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And indeed, this is the great love that we ought to bow our knees even now. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts, that ye being rooted and grounded in what love? may be able to comprehend. So if we're rooted and grounded in love, it's because Christ has dwelled in your hearts. And that ought to be our prayer, is that not only Christ would dwell in our hearts, as we know the Holy Spirit already does, but also that he would have fullness of the Spirit within us. That he would have fullness of our heart. And this is what we ought to bow the knee. This is what we ought to be thankful for, is that we have access to that. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. So our hope is that we would, among all saints, with all saints, know what is the breadth, length, depth, and height. And look at this. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Look at it. We're to know a love that passeth knowledge. Isn't that like a conflict there? That you might be filled with the fullness of God. How do you be filled with something that is already full? Another contract, another contradiction to our humanly minds. This is only something that comes through God. This is only something that comes through a fullness of the Spirit. Now unto him that is able to do, again, here's another one, exceeding abundant. Abundant is like more, more than enough, but now we are exceeding abundancy. We're exceeding abundantly. Above all, so it's even above that, above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. 
And this is the profound love. This is the idea that it's something that is so profound, so far-reaching, so deep, so mysterious that it can't even be comprehended were it not spiritually resolved and placed within us. Look at this. We may comprehend the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. There's four dimensions there. <laughs> That's something beyond what we can feel, taste, touch, handle. That's something beyond our world. There is a fourth dimension that we're talking about here. It's something beyond what we can comprehend. But the Bible then says we may be able to comprehend that. How? Because Christ dwells in your heart by faith. You are rooted and grounded in that love. Hey, we ought to praise him for that. We ought to, we ought to bow our knee to the Father. We ought to bow our knee to Lord Jesus for that because we're able to comprehend with the saints something that's incomprehensible. Look at this. To know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Here's another one. Something that's just so profound. It's a knowledge that passeth knowledge. It's something that we can't even grasp were it not for God revealing it to us and in our hearts by faith. And then the last one, you might be filled with the fullness of God. Filled with something that is already full. Filled with something that it says in the next verse, exceeding abundantly above. I mean, this is just bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger than we could ever comprehend. This is the only song that we'll sing. This is the wonder that Jesus loves me. This is the wonderful love that Jesus extends to me. And it's something that is so profound and yet it comes down to earth to us in something so simple though it's really complicated it comes to us as something so simple that even a child can understand and it's this do unto others as you would have do unto you it's it's a it's a love that is exhibited in simplicity there's a love for the brethren that's exhibited in simplicity and it's when you take yourself and make you second when you take yourself and push yourself down, when you in humility lift up others and do unto them as you would do, they, you would have them do unto you. I believe it is wonderful to receive of this great love. It's more wonderful to show it. And if we want to abide in the love of Christ more and more and more and be able to love our brethren more and more and more and more as we walk this life, we need to do what the Bible says. If you love me, keep my commandments. We can abide. We can be closer to the love of God. Though it will never be fully away from you. Though it will never be so far away from you as to you never experience it. You never have access to it again. Right? Though you forget him and wander away, he's going to find you and love you wherever you stray. But you can be closer to his love by keeping his commandments. By doing his will. By following after the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. One more place. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And in verse 9. See again, we're looking at things that are very difficult for us to understand. The profound love of God. And yet he brings it down to a level where we're simply to, in word, not just in word, but in deed and in truth, love others. So if you love him, keep my commandments. And look what is prepared for those that do such a thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We know that Jesus loves even us. We know that he loves us because of what the Bible says. We know that the Bible teaches that we can't escape from his great love. We know that it's a song that we can sing in our hearts every day, a new song indeed, written on the fleshly tables of our new hearts. But do we fully understand things that we can't see, things that we can't hear, things that which have never entered into our heart, those things that God hath prepared for those that love him? It's hard for us to grasp, but if we're loving the Father, it allows him to love us more and it allows us to love others more and this is where the joyful christian life comes through when we're all in unity loving one another in fullness of the spirit lifting up one another strengthening one another encouraging one another and we're doing it in the love of christ which passeth all understanding but is acted out in very simple ways
just 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 a handshake, just just an embrace, just a, just a hey man, I'm praying for you, just and actually praying for people, just a lifting people up when they're down, just a strengthening people, helping somebody out financially, helping somebody out get get food, get a meal. There's so many ways that we can vary simplicity. In, in simplicity, act out the profound love of God. We just need to be creative and willing to do it. Do you know how God will show us and reveal to us more opportunities for doing such a thing? By loving Him, keeping His commandments, getting closer to Him. He will give us a love for the people that we are around, a love for the brethren that we can exhibit and we can show and we can do it in such a way that it would encourage and strengthen and edify and build up the whole body in love. And that's the proof, I believe, of the love of God and why the profound truth that Jesus loves even me is so important. Don't get bogged down. Take the love of God. Embrace the love of God. Hold on to it. Don't let go. And use that love to encourage others who are faltering, who are failing, who are weak, who are uh, coming short, who are in, in dire straits. Use the love of God through you to encourage and to strengthen others. Jesus loves me. He will stay close beside me all the way. Thou hast bled and died for me, I will henceforth live for thee. We have little kids sing that all the time. It's such a profound song. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Amen. It's an amazing truth. And when we grasp hold of the practicality of that truth, we become greater Christians. And we become encouragement, a strength, a welcome thing to the world, especially those of the household of faith. You'll see more souls saved. You'll see more Christians encouraged and get involved in the things of God. You'll see more fruit unto eternal life. If you will just grasp hold of the idea, if you'll just grasp hold of the Bible truth. Yes, we've preached a little bit from a hymn today. But the profound truth that overarches, that bears over all of that, is that the Bible says Jesus loves even me, even you, every one of us.